Okay. Otherwise, uh, I will um, say a few words about myself. Um, my name is Maya Bott. I'm a senior digital scout or digital transformation advisor. It's maybe easier to understand for KFW Development Bank. Um, and uh, I developed together with almost 100 colleagues um, a guidebook on how to conduct um, remote management, monitoring, and verification for our financial cooperation projects. And that also contains a lot of uh, do no harm topics, obviously. Um, and this is based on our practical work and practical experience. Before I um, had this position as a, a transformation advisor, um, I worked for 10 years for KFW as a, as a portfolio manager. Uh, so actually managing projects in Africa and Asia. Um, and uh, I, before that, I was working for six years in Sudan for the German Development Service and for UNDP um, and for Save the Children. So I also have some NGO experience. So, and before going to Sudan, I was working as an IT consultant. So I try to combine these experiences and uh, advise not only my colleagues at KFW, but also uh, to support the entire industry with our experience and what we learned. And uh, yeah, using this conference here in Chambéry to to think about how to better collaborate uh, with uh, our partners and consultants as well um, to, <clears throat> to get better information, to get better data and to decrease our own um, footprint, environmental footprint by doing that. And so um, I don't know whom of you were able to watch the uh, keynote speech in the beginning um, this morning at nine o'clock. Uh, all these topics that were uh, discussed uh, with regarding environmental footprints, with regarding concentration of power um, uh, through tech uh, applications, um, uh, questions of inclusion, um, of um, what to do with all the e-waste, etc. All these are topics that are concerning us. Um, but uh, now in this workshop, we will first of all explain to you what uh, basically how we are thinking about remotely managing our projects and what this means to us and uh, giving a little bit um, to you of an overview about all the different institutional approaches and tools that we are using quickly and then <clears throat> We give you a, a, a practical example of a project in Iraq uh, about basic infrastructure rehabilitation, where my colleague Bastian will uh, show how we actually apply this, uh, all these instruments. And to make this workshop as interactive as possible, since we are not too many people, I really encourage you to uh, uh, ask your questions whenever they arise. So don't wait. I will also make short breaks to give you uh, the possibility to uh, comment. But uh, if there's any question that you have, if you don't understand something, uh, or if you have a comment uh, to add, or your own experience, uh, or you would like to challenge uh, our experience, then please do so. Uh, so that we have a nice active uh, discussion, although we are uh, we are only here online and uh, don't have the chance to meet in person. So, um, so basically, I would start now um, with uh, explaining to you the basic uh, concepts of um, RMMB. And uh, before I do that, Leonie, do you have a chance to try to help Katrin? Uh, or yeah, we, yeah, we'll answer in the chat. Yeah, yeah. So, Katrin, uh, we have to get her on board with the audio. Um, and uh, so, basically, this introductory video you have seen um, in the beginning. 
or if you had audio problems, um, this is also freely available on YouTube um, as uh, all our other general information on RMB is now freely online available and I will show you later where you will be able to find it. Um, so this is our today's uh, agenda, the introductions we already did of the workshop participants. And now we go to the RMB basics, uh, what it is and how do we apply it. And then we have the presentation by my colleague uh, Bastian on our Iraq project. And um, then we will discuss. So we have one and a half hours for our workshop. So we have some time. Um, so first of all, what is RMMB? We call uh, RMMB Remote Management Monitoring and Verification a framework that refers to the management of financial development cooperation projects remotely um, in basically three cases or in locations or situations with limited access. And this is mainly due to uh, what um, Agnes said, uh, uh, due to security problems, political instability, fragility problems, but it can also be natural disasters and other types of crisis. And uh, most recently, the, uh, nobody had access to any site for quite some time during the pandemic. So. This definitely uh, is a problem that uh, we will face uh, increasingly. Yeah, and this is why uh, we found it useful to, to develop a guidebook on this. But we also have two other cases where uh, RMMV is being uh, used uh, extensively. One of it is if we are managing a multitude of project locations or project sites. Yeah. Um, in KFW, this is the case, for example, in decentralization projects or in health projects and also in education projects where we are financing, for example, the construction or rehabilitation of uh, schools or um, health service centers, etc. Um, and then the third, um, the third application type is uh, if we are dealing with geographically extensive project sites, like large uh, forest protection programs, for example, um, or agricultural irrigation schemes. So there we have extensive sites, which we usually cannot visit ourselves um, uh, at every point. And uh, so we do this, and for this we use uh, different institutional approaches and technical tools. And this is basically um, where we apply this. And then, um, uh, how do we apply it uh, effectively? I mean, what what do we need to? Our, we need to ask some guiding questions, right? And this is also very important not to fall into this trap that was mentioned today in today's uh, first uh, keynote speech um, about um, yeah, uh, happy tech applications, right? So if you find a, a fascinating technical solution, uh, not to basically um, go for that one because it's so shiny and uh, cool, um, but uh, basically what you need to ask yourself is, which information do I need um, for my project management to uh, monitor my project progress or uh, do no harm risks or um, impacts, uh, outputs, outcomes. Um, so, and then I need to ask at which frequency do I need to do I need this information and at which level of detail also to minimize um, the use of data because to, just to collect large amounts of data that uh, is never used is an environmental problem as we learned also this morning. Um, the second uh, guiding question is who needs to have remote access to the information? Who needs to be involved? And it should not only be us as um, implementing agency of uh, the uh, German government, right? 
uh, it also just does not only need to be the consultant or the project executing agency. Um, it uh, it uh, we also need to see how can we get access to information to our target groups and target groups representatives um, and other stakeholders who are inv involved in the project. And then thirdly, we need to ask what could be an adequate source of information to fulfill the information needs of the respective stakeholders. Yeah, And here also, we don't need as many sources of, as, of information as possible, but we need credible information from, diff from really different sources. And we need also to check the co coherency of the source of information. So these are um, our guiding questions to get us started with RMV. And then basically you, you might have asked yourself, why do I need this complicated term RMV? So um, for us, it proved very useful because when we started thinking about RMV, we uh, always called it remote monitoring. We need to do remote monitoring. We need to monitor our projects remotely. And then we just started discussing this with our project executing agencies and uh, um, with our consultants. And they also were talking about remote monitoring, how they were remotely monitoring their projects. Um, and then uh, we got uh, a lot of confusion at some point because what KFW is doing, we are um, basically an intermediate between uh, Germany as a donor and the project implementing agencies or executing agencies that actually manage the projects, right? So uh, we actually don't monitor the projects in the sense as uh, you as uh, um, NGOs or uh, project executing agencies or consult consultants are monitoring the project uh, really intensely, regularly, on a weekly or monthly basis. What we as KFW do is we do remote verification and we wanted to keep this separate um, to, to understand each other better. So when KFW uh, uh, looks at uh, documents um, uh, and prepares projects, what we, the first important step where we um, basically verify the information that we got through the entire project preparation period uh, is the project appraisal. And usually we go ourselves as the portfolio managers and uh, technical experts of KFW, we go to the um, uh, project locations, at least some of the project locations that uh, where we want to finance activities on behalf of our government. And we do, and in this appraisal mission, we uh, go to target villages and discuss with the people and get a lot of information there that is very important to make sure that the project is targeting uh, um, the right uh, target uh, areas and uh, is uh, planning the right activities and that um, and that we can consider do no harm issues uh, at that level. So when we have to manage and remote management in this regard is the entire framework of, of what we are doing that includes remote verification and remote monitoring. Uh, so the first step in this remote management is the re remote verification of the project appraisal. And if we have to do a project appraisal remotely, so we cannot go to the uh, target area or not even to the target country um, of the project, then, um, yeah, then this is uh, actually the most uh, complicated uh, uh, step in remote verification uh, because we have no, um, no long standing prior information um, about uh, the target areas and target groups, etc. Uh, but we have all also done that uh, because now in the pandemic, we had no other choice, right? And then 
Uh, basically, after the project appraisal uh, is uh, completed, we do uh, we sign the financing and separate agreement of the project, and then the project based on this, the project executing agency and the international consultancy that usually supports and assists the project executing agencies in implementing the projects. They start with their remote monitoring of the project, and which is continuous. And um, uh, then at least once a year, um, KFW staff, the portfolio manager and the technical uh, expert are usually visiting the project locations or at least some of them to verify the progress of the project and the things like the infrastructure quality of the infrastructure that is being built, etc. And here, <clears throat> this is the next step in remote verification. So this is the remote progress review. And this we had to do also uh, um, in all our projects almost uh, during the pandemic. And then the last two points of remote verification are the final review when we are uh, about to close the project, hopefully as a success. And we hand it over completely to the project executing agency and the partner country to uh, operate it sustainably. And that usually three years after the project has been finally reviewed, we uh, conduct an ex post evaluation where we actually look at the impact of the project. So this is uh, <clears throat> for you to understand how KFW and many other um, uh, fi uh, international development financing institution, institutions work. And so <clears throat> um, based on this logic, um, I start, yeah, there's, uh, due to the formatting, the title is missing. So basically to, for you to understand our, uh, our, all the possibilities that we are looking now for the project um, project uh, designing uh, and the designing of the RMMB approach. This uh, is the overview of the institutional approaches that we are using. So if we as a portfolio managers um, are not able to access the target sites, we in many countries, but not in all countries, we have the possibility to work with our own national experts at, at the uh, KFW country office level. And um, you obviously work through your own national staff. I know that many of you would never call this a remote approach because this is your normal approach. Uh, but in KFW, what we mean by this, um, uh, to call this a remote approach is because we give, um, if the portfolio manager and the technical expert cannot travel to these uh, target sites to conduct remote verification missions, then uh, instead of us, our national expert will conduct these missions alone. And for this, we'll give, be given more official responsibility to do so. Yeah, um, and so the role of our national experts is changing here. And this is why this is a very important approach. And as you can see, the, the, this approach has nothing to do with, with uh, IT. Uh, also, as was said, we only need to use IT when it's useful and not uh, just because it's a trend or something, right? Um, and then uh, the second level of our institutional approaches is we need to think uh, who is in the lead of the remote monitoring in the in the project. If it is it is if it is the project executing agency uh, who is employing their own uh, staff, and um, for us, for example, a project executing agency can be an education ministry or um, uh, water and power authority um, or um, some kind of uh, national um, construction agency that is kind of public and working for the government. Um, so this, the, these are the PEAs that we usually use. In some cases, we have also projects where an NGO can be the project executing agency or the UN, but uh, this is only 
um, used uh, in fragile contexts. And then we have uh, another approach where we are working in environments that are uh, also usually very fragile, where the implementation consultant is leading the monitoring. And this has different contractual con uh, um, um, implications. And then um, we have, in addition, so you always you have to choose, or it is the project executing agency who is in charge, or the consultant is in charge. Um, and in addition, uh, we can use third party monitoring if it is part of the project or third, part, third party verification if an independent consultant is directly working for KFW. This is also uh, possible. And uh, this means that we really, there's an independent consultancy being, or independent group of auditors being contracted to look um, uh, at the project and uh, this consultancy or auditor otherwise has nothing to do with, uh, with this project other than just externally monitoring it. Um, and then uh, we have, um, um, we have uh, one very important group that we need to include, which is um, the, I'm just checking here for the power cable, sorry, uh, which are the um, target group representatives and the project affected people in a, our do no harm setup. And uh, the, this is something we have developed a number of approaches on how to involve them better, um, but we are also still working on this. So we are very open to any kind of su suggestions how to better involve target groups in remote monitoring. Um, and uh, yeah, but uh, I can also, we can maybe discuss this uh, aspects then um, in the following. And the last uh, approach is to engage with other partners. It's very interesting for us to uh, talk to research institutions or NGOs uh, working in this area or other donors working in this area. And obviously we're discussing also with other ministries <clears throat> um, responsible for uh, projects, uh, different projects in the same target area <clears throat> and to, uh, to triang triangulate the information and data that we are getting from the project reports. And uh, so if uh, with a good combination of institution of these institutional approaches who are whichever is uh, is useful and uh, it most of, most of the times it's more than one um, and the combination of technical tools we then get our ideal uh, mix of uh, institutional approaches and technical tools for our project and uh, now the types of technical tools we So it looks like Maya just lost her connection. I hope that it wasn't the battery. <laughs> um, yeah, it seems that Bastian, are, are you here? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, you, you can continue. Uh, the power of the um, Maya computers went off. So maybe you can take it okay. up. Yeah, I will just jump in quickly. Um, so yeah, as Maya said, uh, there are a, a variety of tools um, that can be used for um, remote monitoring and verification, of course. Um, so yeah, this is just a, a little snippet from, from the possibilities that you see. Um, we work a lot with a remote management and information system, for example, uh, which, is a, which is a good uh, tool for, for donors just to to keep an overview of the financial data of the project, which is basically what we provide. So um, a very important issue for us. 
um, and then uh, depending on on the on the scope of the tool uh, you can also include for example project pictures or even videos virtual uh, virtual um, progress review tools and so on um, then of course uh, satellite imagery is uh, quite important um, especially for for larger projects so for example uh, forestation projects can be uh, remotely verified even actually um, by by uh, comparing uh, satellite imagery from uh, before the project and from uh, from uh, during the project or or after the project uh, also for big infrastructure projects it's very useful um, what we also use in the project example that I'm going to present later is um, drones or airborne uh, technology. Um, so just to have someone uh, within the region, uh, within, uh, at the project site, to um, to go over the um, to go with the drone over the uh, project and um, yeah, we film the the progress of the project and. Um, yeah, the information modeling, for example, is a very useful tool for infrastructure projects. Um, I think we use it in some hydropower um, projects because it's complicated technology, and then you have different that you can uh, work with and design the whole project um, remotely. Um, yeah, and I think uh, the others are partly um, self-explanatory. Uh, maybe I. I'm not sure uh, what the next slides are, but I think they are about um, uh, geodata, for example. Um, Hi, my... I'm back. Yes, <laughs> my power briefly... went off. <laughs> <laughs> I briefly talked about uh, satellites, remote management information Excellent. systems, yes, and yes. drone. Was just about to go to geospatial tools because I guess that's the next slides, right? Yeah. The thing is, I have not many. I think this is the. I have no, no real many slides after that because I wanted to give you enough space for your project ex example. And uh, but we can talk also about uh, uh, geodata later if, if there is interest from the group. Yeah. But basically, this is the box <coughs> of our approaches and tools. And the last thing before, uh, Bastian, you start with your project example, uh, I wanted to say is that uh, we have now actually published our guidebook on all of this. Um, so what I was telling you is the introduction of this guidebook, uh, which has 200 pages and is available, uh, available publicly on our own internet. Um, and this uh, has lots of uh, information also on how to in, uh, design and integrate RMMB along the KFW project cycle um, from project preparation until the end of the project. And also there is a decision matrix on how to combine now these different institutional approaches with the technical tools and data sources um, and uh, lots of recommendations on uh, on how to uh, on how to make use of these different tool types we have for each tool type we have a fact sheet which is also publicly online and a glossary with all the terms and etc and even a, a project location data collection guide uh, so all of this stuff you will find it online um, but now let's go to your project Bastian and yes I will sh uh, share this link. <coughs> And um, uh, but uh, now we go to Bastian's project example, and uh, then we can discuss. Uh, but before we go to Bastian's example, uh, do you have any uh, question uh, other than yes, we will share the presentation, and yes, you will get the link. Uh, there are also two other questions, I think, ah. from Luhan. Ah, if the, the, yes, I saw that uh, if these tools are okay, uh, they are not KFW specific. And we recommend to always use open source whenever possible. So uh, you can see, you will find on our website these fact sheets. So this is an example of a fact sheet uh, on management information systems in general. And this is really something we developed for our own portfolio managers who are all not IT specialists, yeah, but normal development uh, experts. And we just want to explain to them what is a management information system for what relevance does it has where in the project cycle. So in the project cycle, we need this only for the implementation. 
until the final review of the project and um, then how we can use it. And then we have, uh, this is actually, the, this fact sheet has uh, four pages. It uh, tells you then about all the difference between um, uh, open source and proprietary MIS systems and about the difference between uh, off the shelf, which are usually proprietary systems and uh, um, uh, systems which are developed from scratch and uh, some, uh, some middle ground. And it also tells you, it gives you some legal aspects about data security and data protection you need to consider and so on and so on. So these fact sheets, they are not KFW specific at all. Everybody can use them. And there we also um, uh, explain how, how, what we recommend in terms of open source. And there are also some further links to, to further information. Um, and then there is a question about the ex post evaluation uh, component. Um, yeah, uh, uh, our evaluation, we have in KFW an evaluation department and they have a lot of uh, experience with remote evaluations and they have um, uh, written a paper about this and uh, we have uh, included six uh, remote uh, project evaluation examples in our guidebook. Uh, where they explain, uh, for example, how they use satellite data for impact evaluation, yeah, um, and, and different other types of tools. But in uh, ex post, I mean, satellite uh, data is really very useful for, for ex post evaluation, um, more useful usually than for progress reviews, right? Because uh, uh, if you want to see how much uh, forest has degraded uh, after the project ends, then you can see something by using satellite images or a combination of satellite images and uh, other GIS, geographic information systems. And for this, by the way, we also have fact sheets on satellite, how to use satellite imagery and how to use uh, geospatial tools. And um, so if you download the guidebook, you will find the examples on how to use, uh, how we use this in ex post evaluations. One that is very interesting, for example, is when we were evaluating energy project impact um, by measuring increases in nighttime light intensity in Vietnam. Yeah. So we were looking at nighttime light intensity because that showed uh, that there is more energy being, uh, more, more electricity being available, right? And this is uh, also a factor in, um, in uh, uh, standard of living, right? So, and then um, uh, I hope uh, Chopin that, that, um, that helped you already, but otherwise we can also continue this discussion after Bastian's project uh, example. And Agnes uh, was asking if we are also using inputs from social networks and or news uh, papers. Yes, um, especially uh, our environmental and social experts do that to check if there are any kind of, if there's any potential risks with uh, certain stakeholders that uh, might join the project. Um, for example, we check uh, if there was any article by Transparency International or similar about potential project executing agencies activities in the last years, right? Um, or uh, there are also uh, in our decision matrix, uh, we, have, um, we have an entire column on assessing environmental and social uh, impacts and risks by using data sources, including uh, also big data. Um, we, we don't use big data, not very much yet, but, uh, but uh, we do a lot of media monitoring. Um, and um, I, I was just checking if I have an example here, um, but I think this is also in our fact sheet on data sources. 
Um, there is ah yeah, we, there are specialized search engines like Pre Prewave or Bankwatch that that uh, are um, search engines we are using that compile uh, this type of information from social media and uh, other types of media. I hope this helps. So this is the public website where you can download the guidebook where I sent to you the, uh, the video. And here the guidebook, uh, what is nice about it is, um, and which took a lot of work, is that is completely interactive. So everything is uh, full with links. So now I wanted to, uh, I had explained to you already the institutional approaches and the tools, etc. And uh, then we have also a lot on legal and regulatory conditions and recommendations, which nobody likes, but everybody needs to know. <laughs> and then, uh, and here also the supporting IT infrastructure is always uh, crucial. But uh, now we can just jump here to the decision matrix, yeah? And um, this basically um, uh, uh, is uh, clustering our information needs within the project cycle, yeah? So here on top, you can see the project cycle, and then you see the main types of information needs, obviously from our uh, uh, perspective as a, a financing institution, but maybe it is also of use to you. We have here the project progress, including use of funds and infrastructure quality. Then we have the identification of target areas and target groups. Then we have the target groups needs and feedback. This is different because there we already know the, uh, who are the target groups. Yeah, And then uh, we have the monitoring of project outcomes and impact, including the usage of our finance infrastructure, for example. And then we have environmentally and socially adverse impacts and risks, the topic of our conference. And now, basically, um, I will explain the, 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 the thing. I hope I can show this now. Because this is here only half of the double page. Um, uh, I'm just seeing if I can uh, include the second page here. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it is doing it the wrong way, not obviously. But uh, then I explain it to you in, in parts. Um, so here you can see in the first uh, half of the page um, uh, the here the, you have the information need, infrastructure, and project progress. And uh, here you have the, ah, the, I was jumping where I didn't want to jump. Um, yeah, I'm back. Um, and here you have the, the institutional uh, RMB approach and increased uh, responsibility of our national experts. And uh, then basically uh, here in the cell is written if this is, uh, if uh, to give our national experts increased responsibility for uh, project progress um, verification, obviously this is always useful, but they need to train in doing this properly. Yeah, this is uh, always the case for, um, for all the types of information needs, obviously, yeah, because this is our most important institutional approach. And here, um, for the second one, the monitoring by the project executing agency, we have here, when we look at target uh, areas and target groups, identification and needs and feedback, we have here the caveat that um, uh, there is a risk that the project executing agency may lack an incentive to report, uh, that teams need to be the diverse, yeah, speaking local languages and require the training to collect feedback uh, inclusively, yeah, and uh, this is the same here. So this is 
this is just uh, important information that needs to be considered to make this institutional approach uh, um, feasible. And then if we go here further um, and look at uh, the project executing agency and uh, monitoring uh, of environmental and social risks, um, we state here that this is very good for capacity development, um, and uh, but that the PEA staff, that they need training and tools to do um, uh, internal monitoring, um, and but that uh, we should not use the PEA staff for external verification purposes. Uh, external verification, as I explained, this is what uh, KFW doing. Uh, because then basically the same institution who is monitoring the project would verify it and that wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. And especially if we look on uh, resettlement implementation monitoring, there it is absolutely crucial for us that an external institution is uh, checking if this has been done pro uh, properly by the project executing agency. Yeah. And this is so uh, every every option is uh, being uh, discussed and explained in the respective uh, cell of the decision matrix is this if this might be useful or not. And uh, the same is uh, being done about the tools. So here, uh, remote management information systems are useful for complex projects and many sites if you want to do project progress monitoring. Yeah. But if you want to identify target groups, then uh, this is uh, not so useful because this is already defined before the MIS is being set up usually. Yeah, so this is less, less useful. Only if you have already a project and are planning for a second phase, then it could be useful for this matter. Yeah, so this is uh, how the decision matrix is working. And then we have, in addition to the information needs, we have two important context conditions yeah, that uh, we need to consider to see if a tool could be uh, uh, useful or risky. And uh, if we look uh, here again, this, is, this uh, was for the management information systems, we, we say here, if we have in the country or in the target area a low level of freedom of expression, yeah, um, then we need to check for human rights risks. And then we especially need to check uh, about the data protection of the MIS that uh, we are being financing yeah, or using. And uh, then we uh, state here that wherever possible, the collection of personal data should be avoided and data security must be warranted. Yeah. And um, that is the same uh, if we have challenging legal or regulatory conditions, we also need to take care of that. So this is regarding management information systems. Hi, um, both thank you for, for all of these. Um, Kind of presentations and tools it's it's really really insightful um as we are thinking about this um i think my main question is or some of the questions that we have internally at world vision is also how can we cut on some of the of the reporting um and have you found that using this allows you to cut down on number of narrative reports, for example, that get sent out, um, how is it used in link with, you know, yeah. other types of more regular reporting? Yeah, I mean, we, are th we, we, uh, we didn't do it yet because we cannot yet integrate our reporting systems with external partners, but we are thinking very much about it. And uh, uh, we believe that um, at the implementing agency level, such as uh, World Vision is, uh, you can economize a lot of effort. Because uh, um, if, you, if you properly uh, develop mobile data collection systems, uh, because you have your people on the ground, right? And they are doing the regular monitoring, the, the regular monitoring. If you 
if you do uh, the proper questionnaires uh, with obviously also possibilities for open text, but other uh, things where you basically they have to check if this is done or not, you know, and you do a proper uh, questionnaire uh, for them to fill out that then automatically fills the reporting uh, of your management information system and where your MIS can then aggregate the data from your uh, local staff um, and creates automated or semi-automated reports because usually you always have to check on it obviously and to uh, uh, also add some um, uh, text that is basically summarizing uh, what has been reported and uh, giving it a proper meaning, right? So, uh, but uh, but uh, if you if you can help your local colleagues uh, on the ground uh, to have less uh, uh, to put less effort in writing narrative reports that later maybe uh, not many people will read or only small parts of it, I think then you can really reduce your efforts. Are you already uh, discussing this or thinking yes, in this yes, direction? Yes. Yeah, um, because of our structure, we're very much in partnership between um, national offices and support offices. But what we're finding is, you know, a lot of the reports is towards donors as well, if we're completely honest. <laughs> um, and so a lot of work gets put in in putting such reports and so it's how we engage as well with donors to yeah. to see what what can be acceptable what can be changed and what can be reduced yes i think i would use as a starting point the international aid transparency initiative standard because that basically defines the types of informations that uh, donors uh, need to report to their own I mean, to, to uh, their own donor uh, joint committees. And uh, if we basically, it would, I think it would be helpful to uh, define what type of information refers to which YATI code, because then you could create some kinds of modules that you then just need to reassemble for different donors, if you get my point. Yeah. So every donor then gets a different combination of modules and you don't have to write for every donor a different report. Thank you so bye. much for your interest. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.